much. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us today for the Spanish Development SIG webinar. Um, it's titled, Que Dijo? Uh, Identifying Resources to Support Spanish-Speaking Patients Within Genetic Counseling. Just little quick housekeeping details. Um, we encourage everybody to ask questions throughout the presentation. Please uh, use the uh, Q&A option, but I will also be monitoring, monitoring the chat. Um, and please be sure that um, you have your um, uh, audio muted. Um, and um, finally, um, we will uh, go over the questions. Um, we'll read over the questions throughout the webinar, but um, finally, um, Final, finally, with this, I just want to introduce our speakers. Um, we have today uh, Caitlin Maurer. Uh, we have uh, Sheila Clark and Amanda De Leon. Um, and before we start, I just want to read their bios really quick. Um, so Caitlin Maurer is a board certified GC who has been in practice since 2012. And she obtained her master's from science and genetic counseling in 2012 and her Master in, uh, of Arts in Medical Humanities and Bioethics in 2016, both from Northwestern. Um, and Caitlin manages and sees patients at the Oncolo Oncology Genetic Counseling Program at the uh, University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. And she enjoys conducting and uh, publishing research related to genetic counseling, um, focusing her interest on patient outcomes and access to genetic services. Uh, next, we have uh, Sheila Clark. Uh, she is a board certified GC who specializes in genetic counseling for patients who are at risk for hereditary cancer syndromes and sees patients in multiple clinics around the Dallas, uh, Dallas Metroplex. And she earned her master's of public health with a concentration in human genetics in 2014 from the University of Pittsburgh and her master's of science in genetics and genetic counseling in 2020 from Stanford University School of Medicine. Prior to working in cancer, she worked as a prenatal GC at a maternal fetal medicine uh, practice, and her interests include working with underserved populations, alleviating health disparities in genetics and genetic counseling by improving access to genetics care and mentorship. She also has a passion for genetics, uh, education, and outreach. And then last but not least, we have Amanda De Leon. She is a certified uh, cancer GC at UT Southwestern Medical Center. And she earned her Master of Science in Molecular Cellular Developmental Biology and Genetics with an emphasis in genetic counseling at the University of Minnesota. Her thesis uh, uh, during her uh, graduate school focused on Spanish language <laughs> importance in genetic counseling sessions. Uh, in her current role, she provides counseling in Spanish to two county hospitals that serve uh, large Spanish-speaking patient populations. And uh, Amanda's background includes being a supervisor for the UTGCP Spanish Immersion Program, and she um, been with the Latinx Hispanic uh, lead for the Minority Genetics Professional Network and be one of the co-founders of uh, SPLAGEN, the uh, Latin American Society of Genetic Counseling. Uh, and then finally, she is the current lead for the Spanish Working Group at UT Southwestern. Thank you, and to you, Amanda. Thank you for introducing us all, and we appreciate you hosting um, this webinar. So to start off with, just wanted to say that there are no conflicts of interest to disclose. And our three learning objectives for today are going to be um, one, define language proficiency in healthcare and implications for genetic counseling. Two, explore and recognize the landscape of Spanish language resources and how to find them. And then three, understand the development of the Spanish working group at a specific institution and the process for reviewing Spanish language documents. And from here, I will be turning it over to Caitlin to be talking a little bit about the background. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I wish Maria Hernandez could be here today. Um, she's our genetic counseling assistant, and I worked on these slides with her, and she was supposed to be presenting, but unfortunately fell ill, so I'm subbing in for her. Bear with me. I'll do my best to <laughs> do her justice, but I want to give her a shout out, too. Go ahead to next slide, Amanda. So to give us a little bit of background and just really thinking about genetic counseling and thinking about Spanish-speaking patients, um, we actually pulled the PSS, and so the most recent data suggests that about 3% um, of our NSGC population is, is, identifies as Latinx or Hispanic, while about 4% of the respondents um, record that they are fluent in Spanish. 
it's interesting to me that these numbers are a little bit different because I think it, it shows that these populations may not necessarily overlap. Um, someone may identify as Latinx, but may not necessarily be fluent in Spanish or vice versa as well. Um, we are all coming from the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex here in Texas. Um, and when we pulled the population numbers here, about 23% of DFW um, individuals are native Spanish speakers. And when we looked at our clinical breakdown, um, about 10% of our clinic populations use Spanish as their primary language to communicate. This is a little bit clinic dependent, um, but overall it did help us recognize and realize there really is a need both for providers that can speak and understand Spanish, but also um, for genetic resources that are in Spanish um, for our population locally here. Next slide. Um, so I think it's really interesting when you think about the definition of Spanish language proficiency, and this really actually applies to all language proficiencies, but the US Foreign Services Institute actually has put out this scale um, with definitions um, being from zero, having no knowledge of any foreign language, to five being fully native um, or bilingual in multiple languages. Um, I, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. I challenge you to think about yourself and maybe where you fall on the scale with the languages you might know. But I also wanna highlight some of the nuances between level three and level four, because in looking at this myself, I was kind of trying to figure out the differences. But with level three, these are individuals who really can speak on technical topics. Um, they know the vocabulary and have proficiency in that setting. But what differentiates level four individuals is that they have that technical knowledge, but also can carry on conversations in other areas, such as personal life or current events, and they have a little bit more of a broad understanding of the language in general. I think what's also really interesting in thinking about proficiencies is how people are proficient. Um, some individuals may be more proficient in speaking and listening to a language, but perhaps less proficient in reading and writing that language. And so it's in thinking about proficiencies, again, very kind of nuanced, I guess, into what, what uh, perceptions we're understanding from that. And the next slide, please. What's also really interesting and intriguing to me in thinking about this is just how individuals um, learned their language and how they became proficient in maybe a second language. Um, obviously, in, in native households that are native speaking, people will usually pick up the language from their parents um, or from family members and learn it that way. But it's also unique to think about what country of origin those parents may come from. Um, we know in the Spanish language, in some countries, ustedes is used as the form of you versus tú is in, uh, used as well. So that variation um, can definitely be different just based on where the country of origin is for that family member. Additionally, there's formal Spanish education classes and a self-disclosure, that's how I learned my little bit of Spanish that I know, um, but we can learn it in the classroom instead. This tends to be a little bit more of a formal type of Spanish and maybe less um, common or colloquial language that's used. So again, some variations in some of those Spanish words. When we think about our profession as genetic counselors, I'm thinking about it from a medical Spanish standpoint, um, there are again, formal training classes and medical vocabulary to help us learn and understand what some of that Spanish language might be. But also some of us pick it up just by working with Spanish speaking patients over the years and understanding some of those colloquialisms or words that are used to reference different anatomy or other procedures. And then I think we can all recognize in the specialty of genetics, there's also words that are just very unique to our um, own profession and that may not necessarily uh, be taught in a medical Spanish class. Next slide, Amanda. Perfect. There have been multiple challenges cited in the literature um, when working with patients with limited English proficiency. Um, and I'll again address this a little bit from kind of a Spanish speaking lens, as that's our focus today. Um, but some of the broader studies have looked at patients who might have limited English proficiency and their actual satisfaction in working with the medical providers. And it turns out if their providers do not speak Spanish or speak the same language as them, they oftentimes are, will be less satisfied overall from that perception. The other interesting thing is when you think about it from genetics, um, oftentimes patients with limited English proficiency may have just less awareness that genetic testing is available, um, but also misconceptions that their insurance may not cover it, it might be exorbitant in cost, and that they might not just have access to it. And so I think that can provide a lot of challenges to us in one, getting those patients into the door to even come see us, um, but then again, really expressing and, and including them in that genetic conversation and what's available to them. 
There's also been challenges when it comes to communication. Um, this can be both between the interpreter and the patient or the provider if they are um, the same language speaker and the patient. Um, just sometimes things are not translated correctly or there might be misinterpretation in the meaning of what we're trying to communicate. Additionally, I think in genetic counseling, we're oftentimes trained in that shared decision-making model but sometimes there can be cultural barriers, um, whereas individuals may see the medical provider, the genetic counselor, the doctor more as an authoritative figure and one who's supposed to be just calling the shots and making those decisions and a little bit less of that kind of shared decision making piece, which also can sometimes lend to those conversations being much more one dimensional or unidirectional. Um, and sometimes we can't get those patients engaged as much as well. And then I think lastly, too, just thinking about the resources that are available, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what we've done here at UT Southwestern later in this presentation, but thinking a little bit about those materials we might be giving our patients, and we try to give it to them in writing, um, but unfortunately, just genetic concepts are complex, um, and sometimes the content that we're including in that written material may still be very difficult to understand, and so there definitely can be challenges with delivering that. I do think there's also some um, wonderful things to highlight too when we're working with patients who um, may have limited English proficiency. Um, I love the interpreters that we work with. And again, admittedly, I have to use an interpreter for most of my counseling sessions. Um, but I found these interpreters really are a wonderful conduit between myself and the patient um, and working with them even ahead of time to help them understand some of the genetic terminology we're gonna be talking about or maybe anticipate some of the emotional situations that may come up from our conversations really helps both me trust that they're gonna communicate correctly, but then also helps them engage and trust with the patient. And it really facilitates that entire consultation altogether. I think one of the other really interesting things um, that's come out from some of the literature too is looking at language concordance. Um, and what's really interesting is patients seem to gravitate a little bit more, have more satisfaction when patients and providers speak the same language versus ne not necessarily having that same ethnic background as well. And so even learning words such as hola or buenos dias and kind of some of those little simple phrases can really help us kind of again facilitate and build those relationships all together. And what I would love to highlight too is thinking about kind of diversity in Spanish speaking. Um, and this is a reflection of our staff, but I think, again, we think a lot about language proficiency overall, but also we are fortunate to recognize that there's a lot of just diversity in our own group and thinking about our genetics knowledge, again, our ethnic backgrounds. And this has really helped us streamline and identify where there are gaps between us as providers, as genetic counselors and our patients, and really trying to work to help improve Kind of our overall care. When we think about our staff at UT Southwestern, and again, Amanda's going to go into some of our um, work that we've done, we actually are very fortunate to have five native speakers. Um, three of them are support staff members who are schedulers or grant staff. Um, Maria Hernandez is uh, one of our genetic counseling assistants, um, and then we also have a, GC, a genetic counselor, Amanda, who's on this call too, um, who are all native speakers, but they come from, again, different backgrounds and, and different languages of Spanish proficiency. And then we also have three genetic counselors who are more formally trained in the classroom um, who speak Spanish. And again, our language gaps, um, but also our knowledge gaps have really helped us improve care overall to the patients. So with that, I'll actually turn it over to Shayla next, um, who I think has a couple questions for y'all to learn a little bit about what um, you're doing in your own clinic. So Shayla, off to you. Yes, thank you, Caitlin, for that wonderful background information. Um, so now we have a couple of poll questions that we just want to poll the audience. So I'm going to launch this poll now so we can just get to thinking about our levels of Spanish proficiency and then also how we are currently sharing resources with our patients. So I'm going to launch the poll. Um, so go ahead and answer, um, answer the question. So our first question that we had is, what is your level of Spanish language proficiency? And so as Caitlin reviewed, it ranges from zero to no proficiency to um, six native bilingual proficiency. Um, and then as you're answering the poll, if you could drop in the chat where you learn Spanish, just so we can get a good idea. Of, was it in your home? Was it um, through your education at school or elsewhere? And then the second question, how are resources shared with your, your Spanish-speaking patients at your institution? 
Are they written resources in Spanish? Do you only provide English resources? Um, does translation services handle that for you? Do you have a fluent Spanish speaker on staff? Do you use Google Translator? Um, and then also, um, if you could put in the chat what the process was like for you to get these results. Was it easily accessible? Was it costly? Was the turnaround time long? So I'm just gonna read a few things from the chat. Um, college classes, high school, at home, um, one year of college, Spanish, high school, elementary school, really good responses. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So we can see, um, it looks like we have a really wide range of language proficiency on this call ranging from no proficiency at all to um, native bilingual speakers. That's really cool. Um, majority of us on this call have the elementary proficiency. And then it looks like most everybody on this call is providing resources to their patients in Spanish, which is really cool. So good work, everybody. I'm gonna stop sharing the poll now. You can go ahead to the next slide, Amanda. So now that we've kind of gotten warmed up to how we're thinking about our level of um, Spanish language skills and how we share resources with our patients currently, um, let's talk a little bit more in depth about developing resources and collaboration. So why is collaboration helpful? Well, the Latin American diaspora is extremely diverse as um, Caitlin mentioned earlier. Spanish is the official language in over 18 different countries throughout the Americas, along with Spain and Europe and Guinea and Africa. So you can imagine how diverse the Spanish language itself is, that it's being spoken across the world in different cultures and in different countries. So there's many different words to say the same thing. And I have this example here that um, came out of the Spanish club meeting that happened um, through the Spanish development SIG. But there's a discussion of the word buttocks and how um, there's many different words to say that in Spanish. So um, I am college, high school educated in Spanish. My Spanish accent is terrible. So just excuse the way that I'm about to say these words. But um, trasero is a word that you can use for buttocks, but it can have more of a sexual connotation. Polto is um, used in Chile and Ecuador. Gurios. There's pompis, which is used in Mexico and Ecuador, nalgas coming out of Ecuador, and coxix is more of a medical um, term for buttocks, but it's also commonly understood in Mexico. And so, um, again, as Caitlin alluded to, there's a lot of diversity um, of our staff in speaking Spanish at UT Southwestern. So we are able to collaborate um, on these documents that we create because we have versus a layman, we have uh, both a layman and a genetic professional perspective when we are creating these resources. And so the genetic perspective coming from the genetic counselors ensures that the content of the document and the resource is accurate. And then the layman perspective from the native speakers ensures that the content is conveyed in a manner that is easily understood. So that really um, shows how well the collaboration can work when you have a diverse range of Spanish speakers um, creating the document. Next slide. So where can we start when we are um, finding these resources or creating them for our Spanish speaking patients? Translation services is a great place to start for a number of reasons. Um, they may offer a service where they can translate the documents for different departments, as well as maybe already have pre-translated resources that they can share with you. So you're not um, starting from scratch. And then there's gene um, or support group resources and websites that exist. So there aren't too many websites and support groups that currently provide their resources in Spanish, but there are some great groups that offer um, translated resources on their website. There was a study done recently by Westray et al. that took a look at several of these websites and found that there was a limited availability of Spanish resources on their websites. But 
Um, when they did identify a website that offered resources in Spanish, there was no difference between the quality of the Spanish resources and the when um, paired with the English resources provided. So this showed two things. The results really highlighted the need for genetic professionals to advocate for the creation of more Spanish patient resources, just from an equity um, standpoint. And then the other thing it showed is that we can have some reassurance that if the support group does offer these resources, um, that they are um, comparable to the English, the English resources provided. So that was something interesting that came out of the literature. And then another place we can go is to our departments for support and our, our hospital for support. So one thing you can think of, is there any support provided by your institution that can help you identify or create these resources for your patients? At UT Southwestern, we have a patient education committee whose goal is to assess for um, the resources readability and clarity for patients and presentation and design. And this is done in conjunction with the marketing department. And then all of these resources are translated into other um, languages, including Spanish, and they're reviewed every three years. So this is an example of department and hospital support that is provided um, to um, different providers throughout the institution. So this is a place that you can look um, at your institution to see if they offer that same support. Um, and there are some, um, some genetic counselors, um, some groups that have trouble um, finding these equitable resources for their patients. So the chief equity office is a good place to go to if you're seeing that you have a discrepancy in the care that's being provided between your English speaking patients and your patients who have limited English um, proficiency. So that's always a good place to go if you're having trouble getting that support. And that support can be um, in funding or in the budget because sometimes you need a budget to pay for these translations and um, things of that nature. And then lastly, you can always look inward to your team members. Is there anyone within your team that you can collaborate with to crowdsource resources or create these resources in Spanish? If you do have a team member who does speak Spanish or who has some full professional level, level of proficiency, that can be very helpful um, in creating these resources. But you also wanna make sure to be mindful that they're not carrying the full burden of the workload of creating these documents for the patients. Um, so again, this is another thing that shows the um, benefit of collaboration, just so the onus isn't falling to one team member and that it's a group effort. So if you, your team members or other employees on staff are taking on these tasks and going above and beyond um, the scope of practice, acknowledge their work. And this might be in providing compensation, whether that's in dedicated time for them to create these resources, whether that's money or whether that's um, support in helping them with that. We, um, we know this is not easy or inexpensive work, so we really want to acknowledge that it's valued and that it's important. And then one thing not mentioned on this slide is the use of machine-generated resources. The same study that I just mentioned earlier found that one-third between one third and 50% of the resources analyzed were machine generated. And those are by services such as Google Translate, for example. Um, they found that sentences translated by Google Translator had lower assessment of grammar and readability when compared to professional translated documents. However, it had a similar score for um, information preservation and overall intended meaning. So this highlights that machine generated resources can be a tool to assist um, us in translation, but when we use that solely, there are limitations. So we need to make sure we're reviewing them for um, grammar before we share them with our patients. And you can go ahead to the next slide. So things to consider when creating these resources for our Spanish speaking patients. And um, these are all things that we considered when we were creating the working group um, at our institution. First, you wanna know what the institutional policy on translating documents or creating resources in other languages are. There are um, policies and rules in place for what needs to be professionally translated and what you're able to um, translate yourself. So some documents that um, might need to be professionally translated are consent forms, um, HIPAA forms, things such as that. But if there are handouts that 
we just generally give to patients, there might be more lax policies around that. So before you create these resources, you um, might wanna just check the policy at your institution. And then another thing to consider is the turnaround time and the costs for translation services to help you create these documents. And that can be the cost to um, create the documents for, from, strat, from scratch, to translate them. If you create videos and you need um, closed captioning in Spanish or you, you wanna um, dub the voices to be in Spanish, things like that. And lastly, is there any um, available internal or department support that can be utilized to minimize these costs and turnaround times? Um, and that's really one thing that we thought about, how can we um, limit our costs and limit our time by turning into ourselves in creating these? Next slide. Um, another thing I just wanted to share, some resources that are currently available for Spanish speaking patients. So the um, Latinx group through Minority Genetics Professional Network curated um, this amazing, wonderful document called the Genetic Counseling Patient Resources in Espanol. And um, this document is available, we'll have the link sent out after this webinar, but it has resources for every specialty of genetics and genetic counseling. It has handouts that you can share with your Spanish speaking patients. Um, links to videos and resources in Spanish for patients um, and fact sheets on different genetic conditions. So it's a really, really amazing um, resource. And Amanda was one of the amazing genetic counselors involved in um, working on that document. And then there are support groups and national organizations that offer resources in Spanish. Horse is um, a good example of one of them. It's the organization for people who have um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer risk. And they have a whole landing page completely in Spanish. And they also in July are having a um, virtual conference for Spanish speaking patients. So this is a resource you can share with your um, patients right now. That's really cool. There's also YouTube videos. So there's a lot of institutions that have made YouTube videos publicly available that they've created um, to describe the genetic counseling and the genetic testing process that are really beautiful videos and they're done completely in Spanish. Um, and then we can use other avenues of social media. So there's resources on Facebook, Instagram, even TikTok has some um, great resources. Of course, you want to vet these for accuracy of information, but um, I would encourage everybody to go out there and, and look for those resources. Always interpretation services is a good place to turn to for resources. And then lastly, collaboration is the theme of today. Um, we can collaborate as a whole, um, draw from our network of genetics nationally, globally, within our institutions, alumni from our programs, our classmates, et cetera. We can reach out, see who has these resources already so we're not recreating the wheel. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda to um, talk a little bit about our Spanish working group and how that was created. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so I wanted to start off with a little bit of background in terms of how this group was formed and how it came about. So it started. Um, so when I joined the team, I was actually the only Spanish speaking um, genetic counselor, still currently am. And what we what I realized was um, when we started onboarding, they have a really good process here. So I was able to ease into the genetic counseling job nice and slow, nice and easily. And then once I got settled in, um, some of my team members were like, hey, can you look at this? Or, hey, I have this document I'm wondering about. Or, hey, is this resource a good resource? So I was getting different requests and I was thinking, I don't feel like me alone should be the expert on this. But I know there's a lot of great team members here that have different insight and different skills and different strengths that would be a great resource. And I knew um, from our own experiences, we have a lot of working groups. So we have a working group for documentation, process, and flow. We have a working group for GCA integration for clinics, process, and flow. And so that's where the thought came, why couldn't we have a Spanish working group um, to have that collaboration um, amongst our different team members to see who is interested in it. 
And so I did a, like a little reach out, a little check in to see if anyone would be interested. And luckily or excitedly, different team members said that they were interested. So we had a couple of different members say, hey, I have this level of experience in genetics or I have this level of experience in Spanish. Um, what strengths could I provide to the team? And so that's how we came about. And then from there, we had meetings to decide what skills our team had, but also what was gonna be our bandwidth. What would we be able to look over? What are things that we should not touch because it's out of our scope? Um, our goal was just as an internal like working group was to create an aid in making genetic counseling resources as accessible to our Spanish speaking patients as possible. Um, and so it took a little bit of meetings to figure out what that was. But after different process flows attempted, we settled on one that we still currently like today. And that's the one that I'll be talking through. Um, so the way that it begins is we have, first off, we use Office um, as our platform. So it's really great for us as our team. So we have Office Forms. I believe we also have Office Planners, SharePoint, and OneDrive that's used within the next few slides. So I just wanted to mention that as our resource. So what begins for this process flow is we have an office form and all of the genetic counselors, all of our team members have access to this form, including our genetic counseling assistants and our support staff. And um, what we do is we let them see the link and when they have a document or have a request that they want to be looked over, what they will do is they will send this form to us and, and we ask them to fill out what the project name is, who wants that final document, to upload the document and then also put in a date. So our typical timeline that we decided on, just checking in with our team members to make sure that felt comfortable, but also with our own selves, with all the different work that we do, we decided on a two week timeframe for anything that was over a couple paragraphs and then a two day timeframe if it was a really short um, request. And then another thing to make it a little bit easier for ourselves was that we asked that they submit both an English copy, but also a Google translated copy so that we, we, we had something to start with, to look through. And then from there, we would be able to edit, modify, and make sure that um, the document was to our, our satisfaction as a group. And so once that form is submitted, the Spanish working group lead will get a notification via email that the form was submitted. So I would get an email saying, hey, this person has sent a document um, please go ahead and assign to your team members. And so you'll see here the next um, form or the next application that we use is um, Office Planner. And it's something that's been really helpful for, for us because it allows us to track what projects are currently ongoing, who's on that task. And then it also gives those individuals who are on that task um, calendar reminders via email. So right here, what I have is I will first assign a GC team member and a support staff. And I'll start with a GC team member. Our goal is for them to analyze and look through the document for um, content accuracy. We just wanna make sure that English to Spanish, but also even the English, just making sure everything looks correctly is getting conveyed just generally in the manner that we want. And then it'll get um, passed along to the Spanish speaking staff to look and check, is it understandable? Is it accurate? Is there any grammatical um, things that they note? And then from there, it'll get assigned to back to the lead for a final review. And so the lead will just see if there's any final questions that the two members had, and then we'll also um, finalize all the edits as well. And so that allows us to get three different eyes on the document, three different perspectives on the document to ensure that if there's any edits, we all have different eyes. And we actually do this for different, like I said, we do this for a documentation. Um, we have a working group for that. We have a working group for, for different scenarios. So this felt comfortable because it allowed us just to have that ability, like in general, when you're thinking about something, you, you, um, it's helpful to have in general different ideas to ensure that this is conveyed in a way that's understandable to more people. And so once um, the Spanish working group lead has finalized it, their next step is to send that back to the person who sent it off, but then they will also document who just completed the task. So that way we can then assign two new team members. So that way we're able to balance out who's getting um, assignments and making sure that it's even workload overall.
Okay. And so that's our process flow there. And then we wanted to summarize how it's been going for us. So we started in March of 2021. So about a year and a little bit more since we started. And there are, as a reminder, eight individuals in this team. So we have four genetic counselors, one genetic counseling assistant, and then three support staff that are on our team. And we've completed about 40 different requests since we started. And so these requests have varied from gene summaries, fact sheets, smart phrases for EPIC, um, family letters, results letters. So a lot of just variation in what's been asked and requested by um, our team members. And it's also been requested by different team members. We'll have assistants asking us, um, genetic counselors usually asking us, I think those are the two big groups that are, will be asking us. And then projects are completed in a timely manner. So we've monitored to see, are we able to complete that two week deadline that we set for ourselves when we first started? And that has felt comfortable for us. And then same for the 40 out, 48 hour urgent request. If someone sends us an urgent request, we book that up or move that up to um, priority. And that one gets um, moved up and required or requested to, to get finished in that earlier timeline. And that has also been comfortable as well. And then, like I said, projects are rotated two members at a time. So it's been even all these 40 projects have been evenly divided between team members, which has been nice. So based on that, based on what we've completed, we have a comfortable setup. Things are working so far. So then we think, well, what are next steps? What can you do going forward to take this initiative even further? And so the next thing that we, we've been thinking about and wonder is in terms of research. So we have English materials now, they are also in Spanish, but are these resources that they need that they want in either language? We had brought up earlier about how oftentimes these um, resources are complex, it's genetics terminology, and sometimes just in general, they're gonna be complex. So in thinking about in Spanish, is the patient, satisfied is this information that they are able to take away something from. And so that's something that we bring up and that we still are continually try to understand. I, I don't think that we'll ever stop wanting to understand and adapting. And then collaboration is important. And that's today, that's in the future as well, but we want to learn from other organizations about how they are doing things. We have one process flow that's working for us at this time um, with the current staff that we have but is anyone doing anything differently? Are there barriers for other groups? What are those barriers? Um, some groups don't have such a large team that we have. I know we had mentioned eight team members. I don't think we ever said how many team members just in general that we have. So we have, I believe it's 15 genetic counselors and six genetic counseling assistants. So from that, we're able to pull a good amount of people to be part of this working group. But some people maybe are the only genetic counselor at their institution. Are, or only have themselves as the only Spanish speaking team member. So it is important to acknowledge, hey, I don't have those resources at my institution. What collaboration can I do outside of my institution? And is that even possible? But definitely collaboration. And one big one that's, um, that I was gonna bring up is the Spanish development SIG. Right now they are working and trying to be collaborative of all Spanish speakers, of all resources that we have available. So hoping and excited to see what future projects, what future work that we can do as part of this SIG. And then the last piece is being an advocate. So just encouraging your institution, encouraging your department, but also even at the national level, encouraging the National Society of Genetic Counseling, NSGC, to support our Spanish speaking and our other language speaking patients. This is a important population that we serve if we don't have those resources, and if these are badly needed resources that we all um, need, then it's something that we should advocate for, for our patients. So these are just three steps. One, you, you could either consider all three of those, consider one of them, but just trying to think about next steps that we can take when thinking about how we can support our Spanish speaking staff, our patients. Uh, so that was the bulk of our presentation. So just wanted to mention to thank our entire Spanish working group for this presentation. So um, Caitlin was on here, but Maria, who was not able to come, John, Daisy, Lizette, and Luisa, all of them are part of this working group, but also 
assisted with this presentation. And then um, wanted to list, we mentioned a couple of different resources. So I list, we talked about some articles. We also talked about some resources, some videos, websites. So we will have this page available on the video, but we're also hoping to share it through the NSGC webinars page. So that way you can easily access if any of those sounded interesting to you during the presentation. And then we will have our point of contact being Shayla, who talked earlier. So if you have any questions about how we are doing things at our institution or about anything from this presentation, feel free to reach out to her. We're gonna um, make sure that if any questions come to her, she can either send them to anyone that would be able to assist with them or answer them herself. So I think that's the bulk. So from here on out, we're gonna turn it back over to Priscilla um, to facilitate any questions. So if you have any, please feel free to add them to the chat. All three of us will be on to talk and answer questions. We definitely want this to be collaboration. So please, please feel free to speak up. Thank you, Amanda. That was that was awesome. Um, I want to start with this one really quick. Uh, do you mind putting back the um, resources uh, slide once again, um, so people can get a chance to to take a quick look um, at that? And um, I can say we will also. Uh, I also took a screenshot of it, so I'm planning to send it through the uh, through a tweet. Um, from uh, the Spanish Development SIG, and we will also post it in on our uh, resources. Um, so we will have that available as well. And so um, the first question is, uh, I, and I think this is for you, Amanda, um, what kind of smart phrases have been created for EPIC? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I think the questions that come up is because patients are using my chart often, um, so sometimes we might call them to let them know, hey, you have an appointment today, and then maybe they, they don't answer, or maybe we'll want to leave a, a message just as a reminder of what they just heard. So we'll put a message saying, hey, you have your appointment, it is at this time, this place, and at this location, So just, but it's just in Spanish. So sometimes they will ask for those types of things from us, just easy things that we are sharing with patients um, as reminders, as um, updates for the patient. I'll add to that, Amanda, too. Another one we use is when we can't reach the patient via phone um, to disclose their results. We do also send them a MyChart message just to say, hey, your results are in. Please give us a call. And I know that's a frequent one used as well um, in Spanish that we try to reach our patients that way. OK, the next question is, um, are you compiling a database that your team members can reference? so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time they get a translation request. Uh, yeah, so what we do is um, we will send it to the person who requested, of course, that's, that's um, where we go, but then we also have a drive that we have saved of all of our documents. And every once in a while, we also put a reminder, hey, this document exists or this OneDrive exists please reference because that request has already been asked of before. Um, so we, we do um, let people know that, for example, like for um, BRCA1 and BRCA2, those are common ones that we see come back often. And so we let them know, hey, this one's been requested or someone uh, just recently, you might have seen if you were a cancer GC, a lot of amended reports came in and um, our assistants were asking about the phrasing on that piece. And so we were saying, hey, we, we already did that for the first few patients, just wanted to let you know about that as well. Um, so we do we do get, um, we do have a place to put it in, um, to put it, and then we also have to put out a reminder every once in a while to just look through that list. Sorry, I'm, I was having a, I was trying to find the mute. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, the next question is, is there a course that we can take to brush up on our genetics Spanish? And it can be open for um, any of the panelists. I don't know. I've looked. I don't know of any personally myself. Um, however, I do know locally at some of our community colleges, there are Spanish courses. Um, and there actually is one at one of our local community colleges that's medically medical Spanish. So that might be an option in your area to look at the local colleges. Um, additionally, I know our library system here in DFW actually did courses in Spanish and conversational classes. And then they actually had an entire 
night broken out just into medical Spanish alone. So I think maybe looking at your community and maybe some of the resources there might be an option. Shayla, Amanda, I don't know, or anyone, frankly, on this call, I don't know if there's any online courses besides like Duolingo or someone mentioned Mango. Um, I don't know beyond those if there's something specific for medical Spanish or genetic Spanish, but I'll defer to anyone here. Yeah, I don't know of any medical Spanish resources. On top of Duolingo and Mango, there's a podcast called Coffee Break Spanish that I really like a lot because it's like learning converse, conversations in Spanish and you can just kind of let it absorb into your mind and learn that way. I think one other resource that if, if, you, if there are students on the call, um, but also hoping Spanish Development SIG might have resources later on is just the Spanish immersion program that a lot of students do through their graduate school. So shadowing a GC in Spanish who, you know, who took, the, took that time either to learn those phrases or um, had a GC that they ended up shadowing. Just learning that lingo from the genetic counselor is really helpful for a lot of students. Um, and then also the Spanish Development SIG has those classes um, or like club meetings where they'll talk through different um, genetic phrases that come up um, in different um, specialties as well. I don't know if you wanted to talk more about that, Priscilla. Um, I, um, I was looking at the other question. So I actually think that the question that is coming up relates to what you were saying. So I'm gonna read the question and hopefully add on to that. Um, so the question was, well, it's a comment. Um, it would be cool to have a Spanish practice group where Spanish speaking GCs or aspiring to be can get together to role play GC sessions. Um, so that that is actually already in existence, um, which is the Spanish GC club. Um, so we do have that and we try to meet every other month. Um, we are in need for uh, additional mentors that are um, pretty fully uh, comfortable speaking Spanish. Um, and so we do send that around. So if you have not heard about it, uh, please follow the Spanish development SIG because we do post that information whenever it's available, uh, when we're going to meet. And we do record the sessions and, and post the information afterwards on our um, library. And so you can watch that later. Um, and I think in a way that kind of answers the question, I may have missed part of the, the other comment that you made, Amanda. Was there anything else you want me to add or that kind of summarizes it? I think that was good. I might've lost my moment as well. So I think that was a good answer. Okay, okay. Um, so the next question is, um, is, there, is there any interest in helping our GCs who speak English as a second language to have additional time for boards and not to have uh, to demonstrate a disability? That was another question. It's out of the topic and it is stated as that, which is true. So I think this could be open for other people to comment who may have thoughts or support that as well. Um, I'll punt it to you. Oh, sorry, Amanda. As I was gonna say, I'll punt it to you, Priscilla. Do you think that's something that Spanish Development League could potentially take on as find mentors and help with board studying? Um, I think it would be interesting to, I will say this is for me, um, I think it would be a bigger project to take on um, just because for me, when I was taking boards was what was challenging was the actual way in which questions are phrased and things like that, that's challenging. Um, and personally, like, I don't know how to teach that because I myself struggle with that. Um, as a native Spanish speaker, even the way that I grew up taking exams is different. So it is, it is a true uh, challenge just because for a lot of these um, GRE and some of these other questions, you have to learn how to answer the question. And if you start adding um, double negatives and things like that, it just makes it very confusing. Um, and I personally don't know how to teach that because again, I struggle with that myself. So I, if you as a native speaker um, have some of the same kind of experiences to share, feel free to put it on the chat. Amanda, I, I don't know what you think about that. 
um, when you took boards or anyone else who may share kind of some similar stuff, but it would be worth finding some additional support. Um, it could be a potential collaboration for um, with the international uh, SIG as well. Um, it's just that we would need to identify some really good test takers and, and, and figure out with uh, maybe the um, a ABGC, you know, what are some of the other things that could be done to help some of these non-native um, English speakers um, to ensure that they have a better chance at taking the exam. Because for, yeah, for me, I needed extra time to read some of the questions because I had to, it had to register. Um, and for some people, it translates in your brain as you read it. Uh, at least for me, that's what it does. Um, and I try to make sense out of it and that takes time. Um, and so if there is the desire to make things equal and improve the number of um, other GCs that speak other languages, we need to make some adjustments. Um, and so it, it is a definitely a good idea, uh, but I don't have a good answer right now because we need to identify some other support for that. So if you feel super inclined, and by you, I mean everybody <laughs> watching this, if you feel super inclined to, to help uh, brainstorm some of this, or if you are a really good test taker and figure out the trick, um, please message me <laughs> on the Spanish thing and I'll be happy to connect with you um, for further discussion. Okay, so let me go on to the next question. Uh, do you have any advice for students that are training in Spanish but have no local Spanish speaker GCs? And this could be for anyone. I will, I will say one. So I, I went to the University of Minnesota and there is not a Spanish speaking GC up there, at least when I was doing it. Um, so um, if you have the opportunity, especially now since, since COVID, there has been more telehealth. So I would say if you're interested in it, um, to speak to your director and speak to whoever does rotations and just tell them early on as early as possible, hey, I really, really wanna do a Spanish um, rotation and they might not know any options. So then the other thing you can do is reach out to um, uh, different resources that you know about. You can either through Spanish development, sit through NSGC and just say, hey, I know that there are resources out here and I'm willing to um, help out just because I know it might be a little bit harder for some directors, but I, I really want to get involved with that. So I ended up going to Los Angeles, um, which is where I'm originally from, and ended up doing my rotation out there. So if there's not a resource near you, see if there's telehealth resources, reach out to the person who's there, see if you could rotate with them and then talk to your director as well. Um, since COVID, I think it's allowed us to be a little bit more open in terms of where we can do our rotations. Okay, and let's see. Um, there was another comment related to the Spanish club, um, but more in the sense of trying to see we can get CEUs for that. I think this is a great idea, um, and we'll probably internally look into that. And I'm sorry, I hijacked that question, Amanda, but I just wanted to make sure I got the chance to answer. Um, and I think those are mainly all the questions that I have seen. Um, I think that would be all the questions I see. Um, we do, we are kind of on the, um, we are running uh, on time for some of this. Um, so I want to just kind of finalize this in the sense of if there are any other questions, thoughts or comments um, for today, um, you can email the uh, Spanish SIG or um, Amanda, is there like a email? Can you put uh, Sheila's email again? Um, if there are questions specifically about what was presented today in those topics, I think that a point of contact again would be Sheila. But if you have questions related to the Spanish SIG, uh, please email the Spanish development SIG. Um, and that will be related to the Spanish club as well. Um, send the questions to ask to us directly. Um, and um, for the Spanish SIG emails. Okay, sorry. The follow our tweet. Um, so if you go to the website, um, <laughs> If you go to the, the, the community's website, 
um, look at the Spanish SIG and the email and the tweet account, uh, Twitter account, it's there. So you should be able to see that there. Uh, but I just want to, again, rub this up uh, because it was such a great presentation. Um, so it really concludes for our webinar today. We have five minutes left, so I want to give you guys a couple of minutes back uh, of your life. Uh, but on behalf of the NSGC uh, web the webinar committee and the Spanish Development SIG, um, I wanted to thank everybody for the uh, attendance of this webinar. And again, I want to just say kudos to, to you guys for being able to present this and show such a great idea on providing these resources and just making us think about making us think on how can we um, better use our current resources. Um, I think, Amanda, this is something that I will definitely want to follow up with you um, in some of the logistics on how we can also collaborate more for this. Um, but again, uh, the webinar uh, recording will be posted uh, to the webinars page on the NSGC website uh, within about 48 hours. So please look into that. Um, and again, for further questions related to the Spanish development SIG, send those to, to us. Um, and I just wanna say thank you for your presence and uh, everybody have a good uh, rest of your day. Um, and that will end our webinar for today. We have a couple more minutes, but um, thank you again, everybody. I appreciate it.